Balance your trading strategy by adding futures. CME Group helps you manage risk and capture opportunities in all market environments. Capitalize on around-the-clock access to highly liquid global futures and options market across all major asset classes. Just visit your online broker and get started. Plug into valuable educational materials and trading tools and see what adding futures can do for you at cmegroup.com slash on the tape. iConnections is the world's largest capital introduction platform in the alternative investment industry. They bring the asset management community together through a membership platform that lets allocators and managers meet and connect both physically and virtually. Over 3,000 allocators and 600 managers are part of the iConnections community, overseeing nearly $48 trillion and $16 trillion in assets, respectively. iConnections first came to our attention in 2020 during the first wave of the pandemic. That's when their first event, Funds for Food, became the largest virtual cap intro event in history. To date, they've donated nearly $2.5 million to charities. They are also the people behind the alternative investment industry's largest and most exciting in-person events. To find out more about iConnections events and members-only platform, visit iConnections.io. Yeah, people. Yes, I'm back. Not from Italy, Danny Moses. Not from Italy, Dan Nathan, but from Sicily. And I will tell you, if you haven't been, folks... You need to go to the island of Sicily. What I find fascinating about Sicily, we flew in Palermo, an old city. Actually, oddly enough, not that anybody particularly cares, but when I got home from Sicily and I was scrolling, what do they call it when you click through channels on the TV, Dan? I was clicking through the channels. Yeah, clicking through the channels. I stopped on Patton at the same scene that George C. Scott was going through Palermo. What do they call it? Like kismet or something. It's all meant to be. My worlds were colliding from Sicily. It was a wonderful trip. By the way, you're listening to the On The Tape podcast. Guys, I'm back from vacation. Danny Moses, Dan Nathan. Later on, by the way, we're going to have the chief investment strategist from Hightower, somebody you know and love, a member of the IC, that's the Investment Committee, Dan Nathan, Stephanie Link will be joining us. Perfect time to have Stephanie because she looks at things from 30,000 feet as opposed to what I look at at sort of sea level. But, you know, I was trying to think, we like to integrate music into our titles, into our podcast. Is that correct? Back me up. Give me somebody yes. say something. Yes, we do that. Yes, we do. My so, is, yes. Yes. So it was February of 1976. I was 12 years old. I had just turned 12 in December. And a song came out, Turn the Beat Around, by the great Vicky Sue Robinson. Wow. Turn, you remember that? Love to hear yeah. percussion. Yeah. So why do I bring that up, Danny? Because I know you have songs in your head. Because guess what happened this week, Danny Moses? First of all, let me just say this. You look younger, the most I, handsome, handsome you have. So yeah. it is your home plate. You need to go back there. So I, when all you know, it's funny over. you say that. Yeah. Actually, my wife said the same thing. She goes, I felt like you felt at home there, and I did. I felt a kinship with the land. Love it. Yeah, I went to Mount Etna. I got my hand in the lava. So we started the month, right? It was on September 1st. And I sang a little Neil Diamond because I needed something depressing. Do it. Can you can you September morn came in today. I'm like, this is the last our last show in September, right? So what should it be? So I was thinking song, song, blue, ah, Neil nice. Diamond. Yeah. Like but what's really happening right now, right? It's a little Bob Marley. Do it. Redemption songs. Emancipate yourselves from your fund manager. <laughs> None of yourselves in your portfolio. <laughs> so hold on. This is what. So now quarter and so hedge funds that got redeemed, they now have to come up with the cash, right, and all this stuff. And we know what happens in fiscal year mutual funds happening here next month, right, Dan? It's I think it's in October. Yep. And for that, so that's why things always get dicey this time of year. So this is the worst day I've seen. Forget about the, the how much the market is down. The worst action. The worst disappointment, the worst everything I've seen. And since we started the show, today is a defining day, and we are officially, I don't care what the definition, Dan, of yep. a bear market. We're here, and now it's time to really look at your portfolio and see what It you feels get. a little bit more like burning and looting. Burning and we're looting tonight. Yeah. That, okay. So we are Thursday into the close. Is last that hour of the 40? trading day? No, 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 that is also that's Bob also Marley. Bob, the great Bob Marley. Anyway. Uh, S&P is down nearly 3%. The NASDAQ is down 3.5%. Apple Computer, this is a really interesting Did one. you say Apple Computer? Down nearly 6%. You think of that in market Hold cap Hold on a second, terms. Dan. Hold on one second. I thought Apple never went lower. 
I watch on the television, they say Apple never goes down. It can. It's down today. So yesterday on Wednesday, there was a Bloomberg report that some of the production that they had for their 14 Pro was going to be less than expected by 6 million units on a 90 million number or something like that. Stock was down four and a quarter on Wednesday morning. It rallied. The market was screaming. Good sign, I guess. If you're a bull, you'd say, okay, the S&P closed up 2%. Apple was down 4%, closed down 1.5%. But here it is today, down nearly 6% on a downgrade from Bank of America. You call them both. Ufa. Yeah, you do. B of a but it's Merrill interesting. Lynch. So the analyst that I know him is a guy named Wamsi Mohan. And really, I think a good analyst. He used to cover BlackBerry back in the day. I'm just saying for whatever it's worth. But just real quickly, no, this rim, stock Blackberry. is down nearly 6%. It's a $2.35 trillion market cap. How many stocks, Danny, in the S&P 500 have more than $100 billion in market cap? Right. Probably less than 50. Right. And this stock is down more than that today. Yep. No, it's definitely not good action. What does it say to you, though, back to your redemptions? Because a lot of people, we've been talking about this, hide out in Apple, and it's— But wait, before you opine, they don't even know they're hiding out in Apple. They don't even know they're hiding out. I'll say it the third time. They don't even know they're hiding out in Apple. Why? Because of the advent of passive investing, Danny Moses. I'm putting the ball up on the tee for you, and I'm going to let you pull your driver out and whack it. And my concern all along has been when passive becomes active— it ain't going to be on the way up, sister. And I think that's what you're seeing right now, Danny. In the ETF world, right? You know how many stock ETFs there were at the beginning of this year? Just take a, take a guess. Just number of each. Forget about I'm not talking about the asset yet. I'll get to that. 500. In a no, more, Danny. More. I would say 1,850. 8,000. Whoa! 500. In 52 ETFs. That's how many listed stocks there are. I'm just telling you how many ETFs isn't that, there are. Isn't that correct? It's over 10 trillion, or it was over 10 trillion at one point. You know how many bond ETFs there are? Well, no, I don't know. 554 bond ETFs, over 1.2 trillion. That's obviously grown. Obviously, we'll talk about that later. But anyway, to your point, Apple's probably in a third of those ETFs. Yes. Or people are hiding, you know. So the answer is it's everywhere, all these large. And we've said it. People have been hiding out in these names for a long time, and funds use it. As a safe, what, quote, safe long. Valuation be damned. They're in it because they know it's a good company. Well, everything has its price. And now the price is being paid. And so it's a good company. It's not going to zero. It's going to be a buy. Like, these are the things you got to start buying. We say it all the time. It's not about being a good company. It's got nothing to do with it. And we're going to talk about this later, some opportunities that might be coming around. There are a lot of great companies, but it doesn't mean they're great stocks at the time. And again, Apple's a company, just to put it in some perspective, that's going to have Mid-single-digit EPS growth, Dan Nathan. Maybe at best, actually. At best. Mid-single-digit revenue growth, maybe at best. Declining margins. I understand they have cash on the balance sheet, which, by the way, has never been really a plus for them. Maybe in this environment it is. Trading at 23 times next year's numbers. That's expensive in this environment. And I think what's happening now is the market's coming to that realization. Well, the market's realizing a lot of things. I think we need to obviously address... What's going on with the Bank of England? Okay, so hold on a second with the Bank of England, because I set you up, and you were so excited to sing your frickin' Neil Diamond. Sing it again, please, by the way. Which one? Anyone you want. want. You September morning into the other one. What was the other song? Song Sung Blue. Say, can you just do it for me? Because I love what you are coming to America. They'll drive the dollar higher than they're coming to America today. So that was a nice job, by the way. I wouldn't even rehearse that. So my turn to beat around, Vicky Sue Robinson, February of 1976, the Bank of England turned the beat around in a major way, seemingly out of the blue. And that's the reason on Wednesday, in my opinion, you saw sort of that knee-jerk rally in the equity market because people connected the dots, say, wait a second, the Bank of England just flinched. The U.S. is going to flinch. The Federal Reserve is going to flinch. Much different situation in England, specifically England, but overall Europe, than it is here in the United States. But the fact that they had a turn on a dime speaks to the fact that we've been talking about now almost two years. The bond market's broken. The currency markets are broken. And now people are coming to the realization that's not great for equities. This will be looked back as a seminal moment, not just for the U.K., but globally, I think, for the markets. And here's why. Liz Truss... New prime minister, looking out for the people, decides to cut taxes and spend money, government money, to accelerate programs right in the face of inflation and the sterling getting hit versus a dollar and all these things. So it's counterintuitive to what you should be doing. So everyone yells at it or whatever. Same time, you have all these pension fund managers, UK, that have to manage their bond portfolio. And guess what? They use leverage in their bond portfolio, and it's managed by none other than BlackRock and Schroeders and people like the outsource, this manager. So effectively, we always said in the show when we started it, the killer of all is leverage. 
They basically leveraged it. So when bonds sold off and the rates started to go higher, there was a, quote, margin call. The Bank of England probably got a phone call from BlackRock and some of these other fund managers that said, you got a problem. You got a guy who's got to post billions of billions. This LDI market is one and a half trillion dollars. Just put that in perspective. That size of the market. So it's not so much. It's just a posting of collateral. Mm -hmm. Leverage kills all. Anyway, Bank of England comes in. They said, all right, we'll start out with buying a billion dollars worth, which you could a pound and a dollar the same at this point. So what's called a billion dollars of long dated bonds will settle the market. Well, guess what happened? The market saw right through that. Here's why it's a seminal event. For the first time in a developed country, forget about if a third world country tries to do this, rates go to 35, 40%, it's over for them. They can't get financing. There was actually credit underwriting occurring. People are starting to look at the budget like, hold on a second. They're not giving you low rates. No one's following you into this because the deficit, because of all this deficit spending. For the first time, guys, since we have started this experiment, this global central bank experiment, this is why it's a seminal event. They didn't get away with it. It was a short-term fix. Yes, rates came down, and they're going to be there and buy. They probably thought that rates would go to 7.5%, 8% on the gilts. We talked about gilts here months ago. That's something to keep an eye on and watch. So they feel like they kind of stopped it from happening, and maybe they have. But here we are again. All investors want is that Hail Mary. Come on, central banks, who are you? Well, guess what? They got it, and it's not mattering now. And to me— that's a seminal event. Yeah, it's funny, though, that the S&P rallied 2%, had its biggest up day. They're just waiting for the crack. They're waiting for the pivot. And it's interesting. Danny, when do our people, when do we atone for our sins? When, when, what is that? What is the name of the holiday? Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur. What is the date of that? It's uh, the 4th and 5th of yeah, next week. Yeah. One of the first market idioms I learned on Wall Street, probably in the late 90s, was that you sell Rosh Hashanah and you buy Yom Kippur. So we've been selling off this week. Rosh Hashanah was on Monday, and we're going to probably have a pretty nasty day by the time you're listening to this in the stock market. There's no saving this market at no. this point. Okay? And then we know that Tuesday and Wednesday are Yom Kippur, and we will be atoning for our sins, and maybe that's the thing, the pivot. So I learned sell in May and go, which is asinine. Listen, I'm telling you now, if you're listening to this podcast, oh, no. and if you ever utter that that phrase, don't listen ever again. I'm just saying, I don't want to lose an audience member, but you shouldn't be doing it. And if you're wearing one of those stupid, what do they call those things? Half vests or something? We've already been vests. through that before. No, don't do that either. There are a lot of things I don't want you to do as fall. Edge. But let me just say this in terms of the Bank of England. They flinched. I guess they had a flinch. They had no choice, but they flinched. And now over the course of the last two weeks, while I was away, Bank of Japan for the first time in a long time came in intervention. Bank of England. What happened with the yuan, intervention in the yuan? You're starting to see it in developed currencies. That's not a particularly good sign. Yeah, I'll just say this. You're going to be listening to this on September 30th. That will be the last trading day of this month. The S&P 500, as we record right now, is down 8.5% on the month. It's down 10% the NASDAQ on the month. Think about that. In the month of September, and people get freaked out. We come up with all these things, September more, and wake me up when September ends, You know, all that sort of stuff. It's not a great month right here. And so my question to both of you is, like, when you see this sort of price action, it all happened all at once, if you think about it. Um, As it typically does. Okay, so what is this portent? The S&P is below those June lows. The NASDAQ are below those June lows right. here. I, I mean, have an how answer, do, How do you way. save this thing? Price discovery is the answer. What we're going through right now is – we're trying to find truth. Price is truth. I say it all the time. The reason why that hasn't worked for the last 13 years is because liquidity creates opaqueness in the market. You have zero clarity. Now you're starting to get clarity. On the way to price discovery is very painful. That's what we're going through. But we've been pretty steadfast. I know Danny, for about 30 seconds, one podcast sort of lost his mind because Liz Young was here and got a little bullish. And I, I just tried to quickly put my bullish got him on every that once ledge. In a while. It doesn't work. He was, I, play, I can't he do was playing devil's advocate. We've been pretty steadfast in our belief that this S&P, do the math, lower valuations in this environment. You're not paying as much for a dollar of earnings in this environment than you were six, seven, eight months ago. That is what it is. And then earnings are coming down. And we've been saying that for a while, that it's just a matter of time before you start to see earnings revision. So back of the envelope math, 3,400 in the S&P, which is now 200 or so S&P handles away, is not as ridiculous as it seems six or seven months ago. I always like to look, one thing of where you are off the highs, where you are off the lows, and what is the absolute valuation. So I don't think the S&P ever should have been at 4,800. I agree. Okay, but it was. But if you try to be a rational mark, we actually talked about that was the fourth quarter last year when we had this kind of melt up. I'm like, what? I always said, take off that quarter. Now, I think the S&P at that point was early October of 2021. Dan's got his fact set machine up. 
I think it was, I want to say, 43, 4,400. I think we rallied roughly 400 points. Year so, and, and we talked about the season out. I remember the conversation. Yeah. So I like to use that as the level of the top. So let's just pretend that 4,400 to 4,800 never existed, right? So 20% correction off of there is 880 points. That gets you roughly to, guess what, 3520, somewhere in that range where we're quickly approaching. And that's the other thing in this market we're going to talk about is how the volatility is insane, right? So I think we just are now entering the correction. Ter- now, that being said, again, take your head out of the sand. We say we focus on the macro and we focus on the Fed and we focus on the micro and bottom up. What in the hell is going on right now is the worst political climate we've ever been in internationally. Putin literally just declared, just took over four territories in Ukraine today and said, if you try to come back into these territories, it's now by vote. It's now Russia. If you come in, we're going to use nuclear weapons. They sabotage Nord Stream 1. There's four leaks going on. Okay. And I think we're so obsessed. Is the Fed going to come to the rescue? What are they going to do? What is the number? Well, well listen, if, if this war steps up, the Fed it, is going to have to take their foot off the pedal. So let me, let me finish my thought. So it did step up. Okay. It is stepping up. But if that's your hope trade, that doesn't happen to 3,600, Dan, is my point. It's lower. What happened today in Germany? They went further and put in price caps on energy to help the consumer out. But in the middle of all this, let me give you, I'm going to get to a bullish point in a second. You have Porsche IPO, successful IPO today. Spinning out a Volkswagen and going, okay, good company. We can talk about its valuation versus Tesla, which is insane when you think about the two companies where they trade in value. What else happens? Biogen. This is what I'm talking about. Biogen's in over 300 ETFs. If you're in a biotech ETF or healthcare ETF and think that you're diversified, the whole idea here is to become a stock picker. Biogen trades at a 20 PE. They have $6 billion in debt, but it's a $35 billion company, so there's no issue with their balance sheet. My point is that if you're doing your bottom-up work and you had picked Biogen as your right. favorite, one of your two, guess what you made yesterday? 15, 20, 20 Yeah, but th- those are— di- those Dan, are- just hear me out. My point is that we're in this wash of liquidity, right? We're in a washing machine right now. And people feel safety in numbers of owning ETFs. They think they're diversified. Let me give you an example. Let's say that two days ago, Medicare came out and said, we're slashing reimbursements budget for drug companies across the board 20%. Every one of those ETFs would have been down the same. Do you agree? Yeah. And Biogen would have been taken down on its market weight accordingly. Yeah. My point is this. If you understand the fundamental, I'll leave a turn over you. My point is you understand, I get it. It's a needle in a haystack in a bear market like this. doesn't matter because at some point in the not so distant future, if the stock market is much lower, Biogen will fill in most of that gap. But you have massive, well. No, my, my point is, is I don't believe that a lot of people that watch us, listen to us, are trading the way we're trading and thinking about things the way we're thinking about them. I mean, they're thinking about them from an investment standpoint. They're thinking about, so if you're going to go in and buy Biogen after the news, that's not a great deal. Dan, let me ask you a question. Do you think Kathy Wood probably has one good stock in her entire port? I'm guessing. I'm Honestly, I'm not being a jerk here. Probably, there's probably one or two good right. stocks. Okay, hold on. Tesla. When the, yeah, please. It's showing really the, good relative strength, Danny. When the, don't even. He's trying to get me worked up. People. Almost anyway, successfully. Teladoc or whatever yeah, stock yeah. you may want to pick. Square. My point is this. They're all going to go down the same, right? Right. But if you understand that ahead of it, my point is that if you look at the portfolio, you say, what would I want to own away from Kathy Wood within that portfolio that I know she owns 22% of? That is going to get clobbered. I'm not in a rush to buy it, Dan, but you get my point. Yep. My point is that the origination of the stock market was never this clubbed ETF, was never active ETF, man. It was never that. That just right. wasn't, and that's why. Fast forward. And that's yeah. created, by the way, this, I think, this false sense of security. And when things are going higher, nobody focuses on the things that you talk about all the time. Now that things are going lower, these things are coming into focus, and it's somewhat problematic, but it doesn't mean, as a matter of fact, I would submit some of the best opportunities over the next couple of months are probably going to present themselves for long side trades. We'll probably talk about a few of them. What I found really interesting, amongst the many things that have been interesting while I've been gone, including this Bank of England thing, which is just, as Danny said, a seminal moment. I happen to agree. So Stan Druck and Miller, who is a legend in our world, was speaking at Seeking Alpha. Delivering Alpha. It's not Seeking Alpha? CNBC is Delivering Alpha. You know, it should be called Seeking Alpha. Maybe you should trademark that. There's a website called Seeking Alpha. Desperately Seeking Susan. That was um, Madonna. Madonna. Is that yeah. right? Yeah. Dan, Dan has totally tuned me out. And whatever, Delivering Seeking. You understand what I'm saying. He was speaking at a conference. And I will tell you, not somebody to speak in hyperbole, but he said, and I don't necessarily agree with him, but he thinks the next decade for the equity market is sort of no man's land. It's going nowhere. I mean, I don't know if you agree with that or not, Danny, but when a guy like that says something, he's not saying it just to make headlines. He doesn't really care. Tudor Jones, Klarman, yes. Gunlock. These guys have seen seven cycles. Most people that are trading have seen one, maybe one and a half. Listen to them. They're not trying to be, oh, I told you so. They're speaking from experience. They see what's happening. They've been through 
eight different Fed governors. They've been through currency crisis. They've seen long-term capital. They've seen bits and pieces of everything. Listen to them. Don't go in the market's up 500 points the next day and say, oh, old man, go back in your, right. go back home. Like, whatever. No, they're not trying to be. They've made their billions. They're not talking their book. They literally feel the need to try to help people. I really believe that's what it is. Do some people go out there and talk their book? Sure. Kathy Wood goes out and talks her book on TV all the time on the long side. Somehow that's okay. But when someone comes out and tries to be rational, So here, okay. the pushback on that, and I totally get what you're saying, but just to play devil's advocate, just to sort of level the playing field so I'm, we don't seem too sided or too jilted or jaded, whatever the word is, you would expect her to talk her book because she yeah. obviously has conviction. So, But I understand what you're saying. I will tell you something else. And you mentioned people discounting Stan Truck. I get it. So do that at your own peril. But everybody seems to be discounting Warren Buffett right now. And I mentioned Warren Buffett because this week his stake in Occidental Petroleum, Danny, went up north of 20 percent. He now owns almost 22 percent of the company. Now, I don't want to play stock market specifically in that name, although it is a specific play. It has more to do with the energy market. Just let me say this. Dan Nathan, tremendous call on energy over the last six months. You know, when it was trading in the 120s, 130s, you said this thing is destined to mean revert. It's probably going to go back to 7580. Here we are. That was a great call. Now, I'll tell you, I think some of the reasons that I didn't see coming, obviously the stronger dollar didn't help. Obviously, zero COVID in China didn't help. Obviously, this global slowdown that we're in the midst of didn't help. But I think what happened was traders, investors, whatever, front ran the commodity thinking that at some point you're going to see demand destruction, which I totally get. By the way, it's been a great trade to be short crude oil. The problem is, again, my opinion, we haven't seen the commensurate demand destruction. It's just not there. So you're waiting for something to happen, and it might happen, but it hasn't happened yet. So the reason I bring up Buffett and Oxy, I think there's a next leg to this energy trade. And Bank of England flinched, which is strike one potentially. If this Fed, our Federal Reserve, into the midterm elections, Dan, says something like, okay, the data suggests maybe we're on hold for a while. The commodity market is going to scream to the upside, and I think you want to be positioned for yourself in energy under that situation. I don't disagree, but what if what happened to the Bank of England starts to happen here? What if the joke is up? The Fed comes in. Guess what? There's the $34 billion auction coming here in the one year, mm -hmm. the two year. We All of a sudden, we look at our finances north of $30 trillion in debt. Look at our... And when you start to look at those rates, it becomes self-fulfilling how hard it is to basically pay our bills. That's what's happening right now over in the UK. And that's the scary part. I'm not saying I think we've got a little taste for what can happen to risk assets if just a central bank blinks. We saw what can happen. It's massive. So the answer is if the Fed does blink, make no mistake, all asset prices will go up. The market will go up a lot. I'm not going to say that it won't. And I'm not saying that it won't happen, but it won't happen at these levels. And as it relates to energy, Guy, I just try to extract the oil prices to these companies, which are still grossly cheap, which we talked about six weeks ago, eight weeks ago. Every day that goes by and oil is not below 70 or 75 is another day of cash flow for these companies. Interestingly, we're talking about blinking the next Fed meeting November 2nd, a week before the midterms. The stock market, it feels like things are heating up to the downside. Yesterday after the BOE, we saw the 10-year U.S. Treasury yield trade up massively to above 4%, the first tick above 4% in a very long time. Huge intraday reversal closed at 371. Today, on Thursday, as the stock market's getting rocked, rates are barely up. This is a really important day, not just for the stock market, for yields, because are the 10-year, is it starting to price in the potential for a recession right now? We've been talking about the difference between the two and the 10. And so if yields start going down, Carter has been looking at the charts with us on Market Call each day, the 10-year could easily be back at three and a half tomorrow. And then we probably have a break of trend. And then you see 3%. And then if you did see the Fed, if they float a trial balloon, you know that Fed whisperer the guy Tamoris at Wall Street Journal in late October prior to that November 2nd meeting, maybe it's political, I don't know, then you're going to have a good old-fashioned rip in your hands. Because we've also been talking about that FactSet has been telling us on our market call, our main man Butters, estimates are coming down for the S&P 500 faster than they have the 5, 10, 15-year, 20-year average. So 
could we have a scenario where we get a few pre-announcements out of the way? Danny, maybe tomorrow night or Friday night dirty on the last night, the last night of the quarter. <laughs> yeah. Okay, think about that. And then you have a bunch of companies beat lowered expectations and then a Fed that's maybe getting a little more dovish. Here's the guys going to be an asshole portion of the podcast. Are you ready for it? Wait, that, that didn't start 20 minutes ago? No, this is more, oh, okay. more so. This is me because you're going to get mad at me when I do this, uh, but I'm going to do oh, it anyway. No. Dan Nathan, what's the largest economy in, in the world? Well, it's the EU combined. Okay, thank you. The country, specific country. Yes, you're right. The EU combined. Now you're United, playing your United play. States. United States. It's interesting. United States, the largest economy in the world. It is. And you just what did you just say before that ten year yields had a thirty basis point? Is that what you said? I think that's 30, weird. Thirty basis point move. I think Danny? something's broken. Danny, thirty basis point move in United States mm-hmm. ten year yields. What V word would you use to describe that? I'm just throwing it out there. Danny, I don't know. Maybe you could throw me a word. Volatility. 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 And now everybody is talking about the volatility in the bond market, the volatility in the currency market. Then when we were mentioning it this time last year, everybody said, oh, you're a bunch of nervous Nellies. It's not a big deal. Blah, blah, blah. So put that in your pipe and smoke it, number one. Number two, to answer your question, I could paint a scenario here, and I actually think I might wind up being right on this one, where 10-year yields actually trade down to 3%. While two-year yields stay anchored at four percent, if not higher, and what environment would you call it? It's a word for it. I think it sounds like a male deer or something. Destruction, stagflation, stagflation. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, but destruction's a We're good word as well. We're already in stagflation. We are. We're there. And this is something you talked about last summer. So here we are. I will tell you again: the U.S. ten-year yield should not move. Five basis points in a day, let alone 30. But here we are. And everybody seems to normalize it. Dan, your comment you made about 10-year yield rallying. By the way, I'm down with TLT. You know that. I think it's a buy That's a song, right? Yeah. I'm long. Just, you know, I'm long the GOVT, which I share as U.S. Treasury ETF. And I'm actually short of the UUP. So I actually think there's a very strong likelihood the dollar comes in, rates come in. Yeah. Well, okay. Well, those probably go together. I guess my point is this. If you said, hey, Danny, the 10 years going to 3%. Guess what? I think the S and P hit three thousand at some point before that. While that's occurring, so my point is that you're trying to time. And then what is it? Because here's the thing, Dan. It means something different to different industries and different companies and people. Rates coming in are positive for credit spreads. It's positive for borrowing costs. It's positive. There's a lot of positive. So if you're a functioning company and you get the benefit of it, your stock will go up. And you're a tech company and you're valued at discount. I get it. But the point is that for that to happen, and I think it will happen. There's a lot more pain to come. Listen, the case for S&P 3000 is becoming increasingly clear. So Mike Wilson over at Morgan Stanley, who's been on the pod, who we all have a lot of respect for, he, I think, is one of the first strategists to lower his 2023 S&P earnings estimate below his 2022 earnings estimate. Now, that's really important here because we've been talking about how strategists have been offside. So he's lowered his 2022. He's lowered his 2023 to $212. So if the S&P troughs at a 14 or 15 multiple, so multiply 212 by 14 and you get below 3,000. 2980. Do it by 15 and you get 3180. Okay. Yeah. So, I, I mean, the point is it's actually becoming a, a number that makes perfect sense. And to your point, Guy, you've been saying when we were saying, well, we should get back to this is just a technical level. We had a higher multiple on a higher earnings number. We were saying, okay, that gets you back to 3,400, which is the pre pandemic high. So, we're going to overshoot. It's not like we're going to stop on a dime. And that was the one thing earlier this week when we had that match low in the S&P 500 from June 16th, the thought that we would magically stop on a dime and just rally from there made no sense. And Carter Braxton Worth on CNBC's Fast Money with us the other night, he actually made a really good point. He said, here we are in June 16th, we were right at this level, and here we are on September 28th at this very same level. He goes, stocks are not oversold. They're at the exact same spot they were three months ago. And think about how much higher the dollar is and how much higher rates are. couple things. Since you brought up Mike Wilson, wouldn't it be great to get him on the podcast like next week, Dan Nathan? I think he's coming on soon. Nice. Stop it. Yeah. So Mike Wilson, 
We'll be on the podcast next week, number one. And you just mentioned match. What did you say? Match something? Match low. Match low. This is how my mind works now. Match Watch. game? Match game? No, I love match game. Okay. Gene Rayburn with yeah. the stick mic yeah, was yeah. tremendous. Yeah. And Paul Lind and, <laughs> yeah, and yeah. CNR and yeah. Richard Dawson Dinosaur, on the bottom. Dinosaur, maybe. Oh, it was, it was the greatest show ever. I mean, it was really a great show. No, I think of matched tires, and that was Robert Duvall and Tom Cruise in Days of Thunder. Oh. And I got to tell you something. Robin is racing. Robin is racing. Cold trickle. One of the great— it's just, I love the movie. But these are Days of Thunder, and I'm not putting a title out there. I'm just saying. And let me just say this while – oh, Dan, like that one. I, you know, we, we thought we would well, sell a burning under. Yeah. Now, just let me say, so you don't think it's just us three hacks, the good-looking guy from the big short, Dan Nathan, who used to be on the Options Action Show, the old Sicilian guy, Guy Adami. Credit Suisse, that's a pretty reputable firm, mm. I mean, right? A European yeah. full, firm. Full disclosure, I've been an advisor to their technology. You're doing a great bank job. for the last six years. Lucky to have you. They issued a dire economic outlook titled, The Worst is Yet to Come. And think about what we've been through over the last eight months. And Credit Suisse puts out this note. They just didn't haphazardly put it out. And they're pointing out all the things that we have now been talking about literally for the last year. So thank you, Credit Suisse. Better late than never, as they say. So Danny Moses, again, I think you and I both have the tinfoil. When I saw that Bank of England headline that we alluded to a little while ago, I said, holy shit, if there's ever an environment, a setup for gold to work, this is it. This is what we have been waiting for. In my opinion, given the sell-off that gold has had, given the level that it's trading at, given the fact that nobody's been in it, given the commitment of trader reports, there's nobody in the name, gold should have been up $100 minimum, and it barely moved. Now, maybe it's going to happen, but what am I missing? Because this is gold's environment. High inflation, flinching central banks, currency disruptions, bond market disruptions. What am I missing? It's funny. I looked at it the other way yesterday. It was up, I think, 3 or 4%. Obviously, the market was ripping. It didn't do the 2x or 3x. And it actually, last week, when we had a little bit of a rally, it also rallied with the markets also. It was a higher beta play, but Actually, today is more interesting to me, right? The market's selling off massively. Gold's holding its own. It's down small. It's down, I don't even know, half a percent, not even. And I'm not going to call the low low like I did a couple months ago when it was at 1715, and I'm like, it ain't going below 1700. It did. But with the geopolitical part to me right now is the part where gold's going to start to fill in that gap because now it's apparent to me. So yes, it trades on a strong dollar period. That's kind of been the correlation trade. But to your point, nobody owns it. I love it more than ever. This is where one of the assets I would certainly be in here. Again, it's not a gold bug, anything like that. I just think from a risk-reward basis from here, it's hard to really see that it's not going to – because the only thing that rallies this market sustainably is a blink. Now, a blink by the Fed, and gold's going to go to 2000 I mean, that, so my point is I'd rather own gold here. Yes, it doesn't have interest. Yes, I know it doesn't earn anything, but it does check a lot of boxes, guy. So – you always, again, doom and gloom, blah, blah, blah. You guys always, it's, first of all, it's not true. But now is when, if you stand in the pocket, if you're Joe Flacco and stand there like a statue and the world sort of slows down, now is when you should be looking for opportunities. And I will tell you, although I think we're all across the board bearish and think there's still lower lows to be made here, I think we've talked about that rather eloquently, there are going to be some opportunities. So my question to you, Dan Nathan, is how does it manifest itself? So, for example... NVIDIA, that we talked about, was almost a trillion-dollar company in November of last year-ish. Now it's probably trading with like a $300 or so billion-dollar market cap, a company that's going to earn $30 billion. I can do that math. It's trading at 10 times revenue. At its zenith, it was stupid. At these levels, it's reasonable. But if you see that trade at X times revenues, what gets you interested in a name like that? Yeah, I mean, listen, the stock nearly ticked 350 less than a year ago. It's trading at 122. Expected EPS growth next year of 20% in revenues, topping $30 billion, up 14%. So you have a stock trading at 27 times. If people are paying 25 times for consumer staples, wouldn't you rather pay a similar multiple for a company that is literally on the cutting edge? My point is, there's a price. I said to a friend of mine who wants to buy it, I said, I'll start buying it at 100 ten dollars it's 122 down from 347 dollars a year ago it would take a protracted global recession for it to be hard to average into this thing and make money over a five-year period if you start buying it 110 dollars i mean let's be frank i think Stuart sop brought up we had him on last week and he brought up the point of the unknown with them might be 
what were they selling chip wise into the crypto mining space? And now with the split of Ethereum or whatever you guys called that thing, the merge, the they, merge, they the all the miners were selling all their Ethereum and all the stuff. Maybe the demand for the chip. Yes, it's video games. Yes, you're going to go into holiday season. Yes, but I don't know. It's not a stock. No, all right, so it. let's just talk about this. And for by a second. the way, if it hit 110, you wouldn't buy it. Yeah. So do you, okay, I'm going to buy some. It just so you know, I mean, a like, but you know, in late spring, remember my whole spoos and twos sorts yeah. of yes. things. And so I actually did cues and twos. So I love the idea of the QQQ, the NASDAQ 100. Again, the concentration risk is a problem right now, here and now. I think that's going to get corrected. Apple's going to make a new low pretty soon. They're probably going to guide down. Microsoft's going to have a difficult quarter. Amazon was up 50% from its June lows at its highs last month. That's going to make a new low. Tesla, I, I, Tesla, Danny. I'm just going to say it again. Tesla. Is that trade that, publicly? That, st that stock is going to make a match low at some point in the next few months. Match tires. You're, you're going to have a QQQ that's driven driven by six stocks, it's going to make new lows, but then there's going to be dozens of stocks within that index of 100 stocks that are going to start to show some good relative strength oh. that are down 70, 80 percent. Okay. Interesting, Dan. What a great philosophy to look through a ETF machine and see maybe it got taken out with and maybe it's a buying opportunity. <laughs> wow. I just heard that. From guy, did you hear that from somebody? I, 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 so you're you saying I was back. pushed back. You just pitched back my Well, pitch. I've been pitching that since the spring. So no, the your blues clues and cues and twos. My cues and twos. Yeah, no. So I, I actually think that very soon you start legging into dollar cost averaging the cues. And I think whether it's your TLT guy and Danny or my GOVT, I think that that is a portfolio of just a couple ETFs that works for a whole host of different reasons. And you get a little dollar weakness in there. That actually would ask lighter fluid on that if you were to have the dollar come in meaningful, especially when you consider the U.S. multinationals that make up a disproportionate amount of those cues. Who'd you say you had on the podcast? Stuart Sop. Like Stuart. You love Stuart. Did, did you hear the story? Did he tell you the story? Or no? He didn't tell you the story? What, when you guys met at some charity event? So we went to this... What's that place out there where they do all the fireman stuff? It's not Rikers Island. That's the jail. It's one of the islands. Randall's, Randall's Island. Randall's Island. Randall's Island. And we had a, a beautiful night for an event for the FDNY, right? It's later in the night, and at my age, before I get in the car to drive so it's home. Like seven. Go to the bathroom. Got to take a leak, right? And they have beautiful bathrooms outside, but they had a nice facility. Oh, like in a trough? No, 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 no. They actually had these things set up. So I'm walking to the bed. It's a little dark out. Walking to the bathroom. I'm walking slow, and I walk into the bathroom, up the stairs, and this dude with a beard that looks like he's off the set of like a Viking movie yeah. comes walking out. <laughs> and he looks at me, and I look at him, and it was Stuart. I'm like, what are you doing here? He's like, what are you doing? And Same we thing. embraced. We hugged him. He just came out of the bathroom, so I didn't yeah. really mess. But anyway, we had this long embrace. We had a wonderful time. We connected dots. We know a lot of the same people. So, Stuart, if you're listening, which you are, it was great to see you. By the way, your wife is a complete badass as well. I think she's cooler than you are, number one. Number two, and you mentioned stocks. Again, these are great companies, but I want to mention Microsoft real quick because we took a lot of shit for this one. When Microsoft reported last quarter, Dan and Danny, the stock closed that night at around $255-ish. They reported, by Microsoft standards, a lousy quarter. And in the aftermarket, the stock traded down to 242 I remember watching the frickin' print. And then they came out and said, we are not seeing demand destruction. And the stock subsequently went to 298 or thereabouts on a broader market That's rally. That's 20%. Thank you. It all lined up. But we said, be careful be careful here. Just go back and look at the quarter. And the fact that they didn't see demand destruction was probably not a good thing. Where's Microsoft trading right now, Dan? Can you pull it up on your fact set machine? 237. Excuse me? 237. Which is lower than 242. And it's a new 52-week low. And it's a new 52-week low. The point is you really have to pay attention to these things. Price doesn't necessarily mean that things are good. A lot of times price action dictates your views on things, and it shouldn't. The reality was it wasn't a good quarter. The stock was still expensive, and now you're starting to see real price discovery in a name like that. That was a very long-winded way of what Danny says all the time. <laughs> Read your K's and Q's. <laughs> Do Read your, your case. Do and your cues. work, kids. That's what. No, but I but I illustrated it so well. I put it out it's there. A lost for art. You. Lost art. More wisdom from a man who's seen a lot. I've, yeah. I have seen. Yeah. See, that's an age joke, by the way. I'm feeling my age. By the way, I just want the folks at home to know we're going to be what, – what's the next month? October, right? Yep. So that's the fourth quarter. Yep. And the fourth quarter of this year, I will turn 59 years old. I'm just letting you guys know. December I mean, listen, 18th. it's hard to say. I actually think in the fourth quarter, I will turn bullish at some point in the fourth quarter. Yeah, I, you know what? I happen to agree with that. I, I, think I, I like that. I think it's gonna what, be, are you gonna, what do you buy first? What sectors? Housing. 
Really? Yeah. And you have been saying that. You said that. I, I said not yet. I've they've not been acting said, rational, though, all year long. They'll be the ones. So so what will it take as far as mortgage rates? For instance, we just, the 30-year just top 7%. My point is there's got to be a construct of this view here, right? Well, my, like, so, my view is that the Fed stops this QT. That, that's going to be my view. That's been have, your view, by the they way. Will, they will, it's not even happening, even though it's happening. It's not really, I think that will be the first. So that will be the one thing they do when they do that. Basically, it's all clear, not all clear, but mortgage rates. So go back to the BOE for a second. What do you think was happening in the gilt market? You don't think that there was professional investors that knew the pension funds were in trouble? They're the ones that exacerbated. They're the ones that exacerbated that move and actually move, made the Bank of England move desperate. Same thing happened in the mortgage market six months ago. They're going to push The it. mortgage traders were widening the spreads because they knew that the Fed was going to be gone, right? And the Fed is so moronic in that category of, of the lack of sophistication to understand how they're signaling impacts markets on an actual and on a predictability basis. And so whether that comes or not, but then that would be a very consumer-sensitive, cyclical yeah. kind of great play to me. And I don't know where the builders are on the charts here, but they're going to look at Real quickly before we go to opportunities when the Fed does something or this, one other thing, and people keep asking me this, who again, who are not in the markets day to day, they keep seeing these headlines about something's going to break or like Guy's point about the treasury market, it's just broken and the volatility. And we saw that with the UK. I was in... The UK this summer, I was in London, and I was still calculating the difference between a pound a for a pint. For, yeah, it's a lot easier when we're at one. I was in Europe, same thing. So there's things that are getting out of whack here. So my question, Danny, is that is the S&P 500 about to break? We're making new 52-week lows. We've basically taken out all of the access to your point that Q4 2021 stuff was just a fugazi, and the S&P closed up 28%. Year over year, it doesn't feel that bad. So is there a down... Six, seven, eight percent day in the S and P five hundred coming. Yes, and what would be the catalyst at this point? Well, you don't really need a. You quote, think it just starts to snowball. There's so many catalysts. You can do. You pick one. Go. So if it had done that yesterday, well, it's, I mean, over a two to three day period, it is going to do that. It's a sovereign. If it done thing. it in one day, you could blame it on it. You could pick something that you wanted to. But again, that's the least we've talked about meme stocks. What did I always tell you? I'm going to use them as a barometer. So they're getting they destroyed. Die, yeah. Okay, they're dying. So we're halfway there on that, right? I thought if you owned them, as long as you yeah, owned them, them, they don't go down. Yeah, you hodl. Yeah, you hodl. Hodl. Tesla is starting to crack. Yep. It is. So they're shooting the generals is what you're saying. It's not even a general. I mean, that's it's a- like a captain. That's not even a captain. It's a corporal. That's a, just a- Did you see Maverick Top Gun, by the way? Yeah, I did. I saw it on the plane. Ed Harris brings Tom by Cruise way, Ed in. Ed Harris was in it for- you're him. I was captain. so disappointed. He was How in is it you're still a captain? One of the great- I mean- that's Horrible. Just, actually, horrible line. Stop it. No. One of life's great mysteries. Yes, it is. No, you should be a no. two-star admiral. No. You should be a senator. You're a ca- what some of the dialogues seriously lacked. That's that Top Gun. You can't movie. don't overanalyze. Uh, I love Tom. I already yeah. mentioned Tom Cruise in Days so, of Thunder. Let me get back. So sorry, Dan. In all seriousness, when Tesla's going to go, and until it goes, I know we're not there. So it'll go because it's the thing that people still hold. Everybody owns it. They've held it because it's it's working. It yeah. worked. It's not going to work anymore. So how quickly does that thing go? And it doesn't trade on fundamentals. And so an incremental delivery doesn't mean anything. Oh, you're going to go from a $780 billion valuation to a 810 valuation because you beat deliveries by 1,000? It's the dumbest thing I've ever seen. So it will go. And when that goes, Dan, I know we're close. And I think we are close to that thing going. And whatever, it's a Twitter trial. I don't really care. It'll go. I don't care. It'll go at some point. So right, are we're we going to see some Friday night dirties? We got the quarter end tomorrow, as we just said. Could Tesla pre announce? Could yeah. Apple pre announce? <laughs> pre announce a fake number? But maybe. <laughs> They'll probably pre-announce a beat. Their AI day. I mean, it's going to be magnificent. Yeah. Robots running around. The Friday yeah. Night Dirty thing, by the way, I've, I've embraced that. Yeah. It's, it's, it's catching some steam. It's catching some too. steam. Yeah. Yeah. Hashtag like, Friday Night Dirty. Hashtag Friday Night Dirty, yeah. right? This could and be a big one, though. This could be the ultimate Friday Night Dirty. So, yeah. All right. So yeah. I think this is the portion of the show that just a lot of people, I think, try. What do you call it when you fast forward something to get to something? You call it fast forwarding. Right, fast forward. Well, they just want to hear Danny. They want to hear him become somewhat unhinged, which I think you spend most of your life on the precipice of being unhinged. But it's something we called way back in the day when we started this thing. We're almost two years into this, by the way, which is really remarkable. It's incredible. And obviously, folks, thanks for listening. But something we decided to call ROT, which is short for, as you know, rip off the tape, like pulling off the Band-Aid, where Danny just sort of goes off on some tangent, but well thought out tangent. So Danny, as we like to say on behalf of Dan Nathan, the uh, <laughs> the microphone is yours. Well, listen, we've addressed actually a lot of it in there, but I just wanted to talk about, because some of the smartest people, I call them plumbers, in the financial system, James Aiken of the world, we had plumbers. Macro Alf on here to talk about it. They'll tell you that the plumbing is, quote, working. So the market, quote, isn't broken by standards of what you think is broken. So I thought about that, and I thought about, okay, 
well, you can buy and sell something. Everything has its price. Maybe that works. There's a lot of volatility, but I guess that works. So I started to think about what is broken? What's broken is capitalism. When did it break? It broke in 2007 and 8. Okay, uh-huh. that's when it broke. What happened? We all know what happened. The Lehman, the Bear Stearns, the AIG, everything just kind of shut down. What did we do? Uh, hold we, on. I have an go answer. Ahead. Go ahead. We capitalized gains and we socialized losses. So for all you folks out there that say you don't want to be socialist, guess what? You're already there. The yeah. system, you did not allow the system to work back to you. So we kind of mass, we, we put it on a sinking ship bubble gum, and we did it, and it worked, right? It's worked for a long period of time, but it obviously sent people out on the risk curve. It leveraged out the wazoo. All these things that were happening, never believing there would be a time that we would have to pay the pipers, started to go back and look at all the things that have gone into that. And it's not just about what the Fed did, Treasury, what they did, Global Central Bank's a lot into it. Let me go backwards here. So we had an equity flash crash, May 6, 2010. So we knew that there's been problems building within the algo markets for a while, right? We had a bond flash crash, which you on in October 2014, which, by the way, I might add, do you know what that flash crash was, just to put in perspective what we called a flash crash back then? We went from 2.2% to 1.86% in a minute. Ooh, how does that pale in comparison now to these intraday moves we're seeing? That was a bond flash crash. And you know what the result of the investigation by seven federal authorities was? They could not find a reason for it. That's October 14th. March 2015, the U.S. dollar dropped 3% in four minutes, right? Whatever. August 2015, stock market lost 5% in five minutes. Yen Aussie dollar, the day that Apple pre-announced in 2019, that dropped 7%. So we've had all this stuff go on. But I'm going to bring this all back full circle here, Dan, I promise. In 2015, the SEC started to investigate what was called 12B1 fees. What are 12B1 fees? Those are mutual fund fees that are paid to brokers for putting Guy Adami in the Lord Abbott growth and income fund. So if I'm a broker... The, the Lord Abbott guy comes and takes me out. I'm just using them as an example. I have nothing against Lord Abbott, full, full disclaimer. They come out and take you to golf, and you're going to go sell their funds to me. I'm your client. Hey, Danny, have you looked at the – at the end of the day, I'm like, sure, put me in it because it doesn't matter. But you were getting fees for pushing me into the product. So the brokers got that basically, that revenue stream broken off. They weren't able to get it anymore. So what did they do? They changed their business model. At the same time, the passive investing was growing. At the same time, they became – managers that would get a fee of 1% for all your assets that you have and trade you out all these ETFs, the advent of passive growth was occurring. There's a cause for all the stuff that is happening now. I mentioned before about stock ETFs, how they ballooned, bond market ETFs. So we talk about bond market volatility, 554 of them over $1.2 trillion, which have gone in because as a broker. Now, there are some good brokers out there. People that call their clients, ask how they're doing. They're all hiding right now. No one's doing And they own ETFs, so they feel like they're diversified. They don't own individual securities, so it's like less risky. But all these things have gone into, quote, filling an elephant through a faucet, literally trying to put these things through. And that's where we happen. So my definition of broken is capitalism, 2000, throw in ESG investing, which helped break this system also in terms of how it was implemented, the logic behind it or not behind it that went in. So it's not just about the broke, but we've been living in this fantasy world for a long time that has been crafted. Well, not, by, well, but by, Danny, is it capitalism that's broken or market structures that's broken? I, mean, like, well, me, I brought in market structure, but yeah. it's capitalism because pri- to me, capitalism is price discovery, risk reward. If you take a risk and lose, you lose. We've been bailed out. The moral hazard created in 2008-9 has fueled I agree with this Danny leverage this in the market. So there's leverage everywhere. I mean, what just took down the pension funds? In England, was leverage. When it's I was pretty in, simple. When I was in grade school, they leveraged? Yeah. Uh, when I was in grade school, I had a friend, Charlie. Uh, you know, Charlie you know, Munger. He was a couple years older than I was. <laughs> that was good. Uh, yeah. but, but he went on, people started calling him Charles in the later years, and he came up with something called Darwinism. And I'm a big fan of corporate Darwinism, survival of the fittest, and we've taken that out. We somehow prop up things that we shouldn't be propping up. So to Danny's point, in that prism capitalism is dead broken never be dead but it's broken, broken. it needs to be fixed and it's going to be so you know what fixes it s&p at 2800 29 no. it starts to fix itself because you get rid of the bro it starts to fix itself over time we never fully realized the pain that we should have in 2008 and 9 that's it we are good rock. believe it or not good we're at week four in the league where they play for pay i was away for all of it from some of it yeah uh, my New York football Giants got off to a 2-0 start. They lost to the Cowboys a game that was in their grasp, but okay, whatever. It doesn't matter. But if you do recall, very early on, we talked about the Eagles you being, did. I mean, and that team, everybody seems to love the Eagles now, and Jacksonville, surprisingly, 2-1. and one. But as we get into week four, Danny, because I know you love to do this, I think you're 4-4 four and four as we enter week four. Not great. Which for you is shitty. Yeah. 
Well, at least I won some money back from Dan last week on shorting Tom Brady. So, so can I ask you guys a question? Speaking of Tom Brady, sure how so. are the Buccaneers at home favored by one over the Chiefs? Is that the line right now? Because yeah. I have it actually at even. This is one of my games. So let me go into my picks here. But that's a great question. I, I mean, like how uh, Who do you they like? looked they looked horrible. Who looked horrible? They, I, and I took the. <laughs> Who looked horrible? The Bucks. Yeah. Chiefs didn't look much better, by no, the way. No, I the know. Colts, and the, I had, and, by the and way, your, I took, and your talk, bills didn't look very good. Can either. we talk? Oh, they're injured. Can we talk about I was on Ned show breaking even with the coach? I took okay, coach again. You're yelling at me. I had the Colts and I had Did Packers. Really? Last. Yeah, he owes me another two hundred. And so does uh, Yeah, so does Ned. Anyway. By the way, the coach said to me, if Danny calls me one time for his money, yeah. I'm gonna beat him over there. Well, I'm gonna Venmo request him yeah. right after the show's you over. Should, so. actually. And I go on their show. I said, why don't you come on our show and pick stocks? Who kind of looked at me cross eyed. Anyway. Uh, so Kansas City, I'm going to keep shorting Tom Brady as long as he's favored or even even in something. He does not want to be out there. This and I, the Chiefs are angry after what happened last week. Kansas City in a pick'em is what I see. Dan uh, in Tampa, you want Tampa? No. Oh boy, I don't like my KC pick as much. So take the Chiefs there. <laughs> All right, the New York Jets. By the way, while you were in Italy, a miracle happened in the that was. That okay. I, I read that. I'm like, yeah. this has to be a mystery. Yeah. yeah and now no. Zach Wilson, the Savior, is coming back. Yeah, Guess wow. what? Do you think the Steelers are going to be one and three? No. I don't either. So Pittsburgh's laying three against the Jets. I will take Pittsburgh in that game. So that's my second pick. And my third pick is a Thursday night game, which I will tweet out like I did. I will, the only first game I won of the season was on a Thursday night. Cincinnati is going to roll on Miami tonight, right? Everyone gets healthy when they play the Jets. They tend to look better, like, you know, the next week. So Cincy at home giving three and a half, maybe by the half point. Actually, by the half point, minus 120. Uh, against Miami. Miami just came out of that Bills game, right? I mean, that was a hell of a game, very physical. Yeah. Traveling up, it was hurricane week. God, I hope everybody's okay down in Florida, by the way. Hurricane week, I don't know. It's got to be a little bit discombobulating to them. So I like Cincinnati laying the three. And those are my – Dan, do you want any of those? No. But what, what about this? Bears at Giants, Bears getting three. I like the Bears. I did too. I'm going to have a horrible week in the NFL. <laughs> it's it's going to be a horrible week. Uh, Dan, here's the other thing. I like the Pats getting 10.5, Jacksonville plus 6.5. Pats getting 10.5 versus Pack at Green Bay? Yeah. Nah. But, okay. Anyway, we'll come up with something else over the weekend. Podcast four is four. going on too long. You know, it's interesting. And Podcast gonna, is going to. You, you, you if you're bored, I'm then, worried. Then the no, people yeah. must be You should have yeah. just. That's one of those things where you won the championship. You basically ended the year undefeated. You should have never I made know. another NFL bet. I know, but, you know, four and four, it's, yeah, I'm some people saying. celebrate. What about 10%. this uh, Jacksonville at Philly? By the way, as good as the S&P's done in September. What's that? Jacksonville at Philly, Philly minus six and a half. I like Jacksonville, but I don't, I'm not betting it. Anyway. I'll take the Eagles. You take Jacksonville. You're getting six and a half. Fine. Doesn't count as one of my picks. Doesn't count as five hundred. Picks, 500. Okay, you're done. There's something wrong with that line, by the way. Exactly. It should scare so, you. It yep. should scare you. Yep. What else should scare you is the fact that we've really gone long, but when we come back, Stephanie Link, chief investment strategist, member of the IC, you love her on CNBC, from Hightower, Stephanie Link will join us here on the tape. Introducing event contracts from CME Group for individual investors who want a new, less complex way to trade some of the world's most recognized futures markets. They're smaller, lower cost, with predefined risk. Event contracts let you trade your views on daily up or down price moves in equities, gold, oil, and more. The markets you know and use every day. Take a position by choosing a side with event contracts from CME Group. Learn more at cmegroup.com slash event contracts. iConnections is the world's largest capital introduction platform in the alternative investment industry. They bring the asset management community together through a membership platform that lets allocators and managers meet and connect both physically and virtually. Over 3,000 allocators and 600 managers are part of the iConnections community, overseeing nearly $48 trillion and $16 trillion in assets, respectively. iConnections first came to our attention in 2020 during the first wave of the pandemic. That's when their first event, Funds for Food, became the largest virtual cap intro event in history. To date, they've donated nearly $2.5 million to charities. They are also the people behind the alternative investment industry's largest and most exciting in-person events. To find out more about iConnections events and members-only platform, visit iConnections.io. Hey, it's Dan here. I'm excited to tell you about a $1 billion app that's disrupting the way people like you and me invest. It's called Masterworks. They offer investors access to an estimated $1.7 trillion alternative asset that was once only accessible by the ultra-wealthy. I'm talking about blue-chip art. 
Blue chip art has seen price appreciation that's outpaced the S&P 500 by 164% from 1995 to 2021. And the Wall Street Journal recently called it among the hottest markets on earth. It's no wonder the ultra-rich like Jeff Bezos recently sold tons of Amazon stock and bought more art. And now you can too with the art investment app called Masterworks.io. Join over 300,000 members for free on Masterworks.io. Just go to Masterworks.art slash tape. That's masterworks.art slash tape. See important disclosures at masterworks.io slash disclaimer. Stephanie Link is the chief investment strategist and portfolio manager at Hightower, a national wealth management firm that provides investment, financial, and retirement planning services to individuals, foundations, and family offices, as well as 401k consulting and cash management services to corporations. She's also a CNBC contributor. You know her from the Halftime Report, Squawk Box, the OT, and more. Stephanie, welcome back to On the Tape. Dan, what do they say when you ask somebody to come back because there was a lot of popular demand? What's that saying? Back by popular demand. Oh, is that what they say? Back by popular demand. So in November of last year, Stephanie Link joined us on the tape. And obviously, backed by popular demand, Stephanie Link. But before you utter a sound, Steph, I will say this. So I've been doing this quite some time, as Dan will tell you. And a lot of people ask about a lot of guests and panelists on CNBC. But one of the most frequent questions I get is about Stephanie Link. They're enamored by your intelligence, your poise, and quite frankly, your honesty. And I am as well. So it's great having you back here on the tape. Thank you both very much. It's great to be back. I can't believe it's been so long. It's coming up to, what is it, 10 months or so. And think about what's changed over those you know, last 10 months. I mean, we, we'll get into it, obviously, but your job is difficult. It becomes even more difficult when we're seeing some of the things we've seen, not only over the last couple of months, but over the last couple of days. So maybe just speak to that and we'll get into it. Sure. Well, I mean, I think this year has been, all of us can attest to this, it's been so challenging because there are so many unknowns. I think when you look at the last three years, the compounded annual growth rate of the S&P 500 was 28%. That's not normal, but people began to believe that it was normal and anybody could have made money in the last three years. And a lot of that was driven by the enormous amount of fiscal and monetary policy stimulus. We all know that. So you fast forward to this year, and now all of a sudden you have more restrictive policy, both fiscal and monetary. I know we got a couple of things passed on the fiscal side, but it's a lot less than it had been. And um, the monetary policy, my goodness, this is a complete about phase with the Fed. And so in addition to that, you have huge, huge inflation, and we can get into sticky parts and non-sticky parts. The point of the matter is, is you just can't have inflation where it is, and it's going to take a while to get that back down. So you have this Fed that is kind of putting the pedal to the metal. And in my career, I don't know if I've ever seen the speed of the changes of the increases in the Fed monetary policies, meaning higher interest rates. And we won't feel that until another six to nine months because there is a lag impact. And so that's why you've got these unknowns, the Fed's doing their thing, and then Fast forward, but we were already seeing a slow economy. What does this do for 2023 in terms of a recession? All that being said, I certainly don't want to start on a really negative note because you guys know me by now. I pretty much try to look at the glass as half full. And I would simply say the S&P is down 23% year to date, NASDAQ down 31. And if you think about the long-term average compound annual growth rate in the S&P 500, the total return, it's 10%. So you're going to have ups and downs and mean reversions all over the place. And I think that's really what you're seeing this year, unfortunately, is not only a mean reversion in equities, but fixed income. People forgot they could lose money in fixed income. Now everyone's losing money in spades and everyone is so down and out. These are the kinds of times when maybe you want to start looking past some of this stuff and we can talk about opportunities for sure. 
Yeah. So Steph, you bring up a really good point about the average return of the S&P 500. You also bring up the point of the average decline of the S&P 500 in a recession. And right now, like you said, we're down 23%. The average decline is down about 30 or so during a recession. Well, we haven't had the recession yet. And we have fears of a recession because to your point, the lag in which some of this tighter monetary policy is going to take to kind of seep its way through the economy. I just say one of the biggest things right now is if you take out the 2020 20 recession that we had in February, March, April, in the spring of 2020 during the pandemic, and you go back to the financial crisis, and then you go back to the post.com period, in both instances, the Federal Reserve went from being slightly hawkish to very, very dovish. And so to your point before, now they're as hawkish as they've ever been in our lifetimes. And so that's why this might be different to me before we've even had the official bell ring of the recession. I'm just curious, is it different this time? Because again, we've all been just lulled into this by the dip. And whenever we have any storm clouds on the horizon, the Fed gets easy. Well, yeah, no, I mean, it's been a buy the dip for the last 10 years, right? And so it certainly is not that this year. I just don't buy into the fact that what some of the market pundits like at Delivering Alpha today, for example, said you won't make money in the Dow or the S&P for the next 10 years. So many things can change. And the Fed has got to get inflation under control, but they will. And in that process, certainly we are going to slow. We might see a recession. I have a pretty high odds that we will next year, but markets are forward-looking mechanisms. And while we could go down more, certainly, as you mentioned, Dan, the average in a recession, the market goes down 30%, you're down 23%. So your risk reward is certainly starting to get more interesting. That all being said, I think we need the Fed to pivot for us to really take off or at least get hints of them trying to pivot. Now, the BOE today, the Bank of England, did change their monetary policy today. So they went from QT to QE, and who the heck knows what's going on over there. But here's the reason why I don't think the Fed is going to pivot following this news. It's because the BOE, one of their mandates is financial stability. And their bond market their fixed income market was in disarray. They had to fix the bond market. And I don't know if these actions actually do fix it, but they had to calm it all down. The Fed's mandate, as you both know, it's a dual mandate. It's jobs and it's inflation. Well, jobs are okay. They're actually quite strong. And inflation is quite high, as I've mentioned now a couple of times. So the Fed is going to have to continue to at least jawbone talk about being more hawkish for a bit more time. I do think eventually they are going to be successful. We are already starting to see parts of inflation come down on the commodity side of things. And so we just have to wait. We have to wait it out and see, and it's going to take some time. We've made a lot of money over the last many years. Just take a deep breath. And this is the time when I look to upgrade my portfolio, buy number ones and number twos in the industry. And I know both of you are doing the very same thing. When you watch the shows that you're on, I mean, you're one of the people that can stand in the pocket. When the world gets faster, you slow things down. I mean, that's a skill set, and I'm not blowing smoke. It happens to be true. You bring up all the time, Stephanie. It's important. People forget. A lot of this is conversation. But what it comes down to, the foundations of the market are earnings, earnings growth, revenue, and revenue growth, and what you're willing to pay for those things. And you break that down with individual stocks, and you break it down with the market. So here we are. A lot of people are doing back-of-the-envelope math, coming to different price targets for the S&P. In the environment that we're in and will probably continue to be in for the foreseeable future, what's the right multiple and what's your earnings sort of outlook? Because that really is how you get to the S&P number. You guys are asking all the right questions, and these are really hard to answer because you know the long-term average multiple on the S&P 500 is anywhere from 14 to 16 times, depending on where interest rates are. I would kind of lean more towards the 14 times given where interest rates are, right? They're a lot higher. And so here's the thing. All the things we just talked about, the economy slowing, the Fed doing their, their thing, the global economy is also slowing, certainly is going to put pressure on earnings. I'm kind of surprised earnings haven't come down for next year. Strategists are still, and economists are still expecting about 8% for next year. That's way too high. We know that. We absolutely know that. Here's the thing though. I mean, I feel like not only are the broader averages down so much, stocks are down, some of them are down 40 and 50%. And so sure, earnings might come down. And so maybe they're not as cheap as we thought, but they're discounting a lot of bad news. And so 
I feel like the broader averages, I feel are going to be choppy and remain choppy, but I think you can take advantage of some of these high quality companies that I mentioned before, number one, number two in the industry, buying back a whole bunch of stock, balance sheets are great, free cash flow is strong. Those kind of companies that are down 30, 40, 50%, I think is worth a nibble, at least if you have a longer term time horizon. But yeah, for, for the foreseeable future guy, you're, you're spot on. It's going to be choppy for sure. That's going to be the tell, right? One of these companies is going to say something, and I'm not suggesting I know who it's going to be. They're going to say something that's pretty bad, and the stock action is going to be pretty good. And then you're going to start looking at things and say, you know what? The market's finally discounted it. Now, the other side of that is a name like Federal Express. Now, listen, I think most of Federal Express is Federal Express specific, but you can't underestimate some of the things that have happened. So there's so many cross currents here. But we're starting to see it. And I would submit, as much as it's a good thing that we haven't seen demand come down yet, might be a bad thing as well, because there's an inevitability to all this. And we're getting hints of it from Apple, and we'll see what happens with some of these other names. But I think we're closer to that than we've obviously been in quite some time. And I would submit, Steph, that's probably a healthy thing. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think there are so many people that are so nervous that are negative, that are throwing in the towel. I talked to a lot of advisors at Hightower and they are kind of pulling their hair out. There are many PMs you guys know and I know that haven't ever seen inflation like this or have never seen a Fed this aggressive. And I barely have seen it. And I've been in the business for 30 years. So we know there are some PMs that are running money that are just scared out of their minds. And that's a terrible way to invest. You've got to take emotion out of it Everybody says they buy low and sell high. They don't. They buy high and they sell low. And we know that to be a fact. It's really, really hard to buy low. And when I know it's kind of sort of getting in the right frame of mind to be buying, it's like when I'm under my desk and I'm hitting the buy button and it's really challenging. And that's really what's going on right now. It's really challenging. So look, we have a lot to get through. We have earnings in a couple of weeks. We'll get a lot of information it's not the worst thing in the world to have a recession. Recessions happen. And we'll come out on the other side of this just fine. Let's talk about earnings because to the point that you just made with estimates starting to come down a little bit, that was kind of the story of the Q2 earnings period into July where we saw estimates come down. When we saw the actual results, they weren't as bad as some had feared because they're now coming in line or beating lowered estimates. And so we had that late July into August ramp here. I read a stat from FactSet earlier today that Q3 earnings have come down far greater over 5, 10, 15, 20 year average. So analysts and strategists are starting to get the memo here for the price action to the downside. Do you think there's a potential though, despite the poor visibility? When Guy just mentioned FedEx, you have to think the strong dollar is impacting that. Just all the disruption to global supply chains, the wars, continued lockdowns in China. This is not going to be a great quarter for multinationals. So do you think there's a chance that investors with lowered expectations start looking by that? And to Guy's point, we woke up this morning, there was a Bloomberg report that Apple is cutting back some production of iPhones. They just released it. The stock was down four and a quarter percent pre-opening. The stock market's screaming here. It's only down one and a half percent or so. Is it a possibility that we see a kind of look past this current quarter? I think there's a very good chance that we look past this quarter. I think that Companies are going to use this quarter perhaps to kitchen sink some things too, right? I mean, we know all the things that you just mentioned. We all we know all the negatives. Do we know any positives? How about companies that have pricing power? How about companies that over the last three years, they were forced to streamline their businesses, to think differently, to buy more technology and get more productive? U.S. companies are so resilient. And I'm not saying it's different this time because the numbers are going to come down. We know it. It's just a matter of how can they manage it and which companies can get out to the other side in a healthy fashion. And when you have some companies, the bluest of blue chip companies, Starbucks comes to mind, Chevron comes to mind, Meta comes to mind. When you have these companies that are down so much, well, Chevron's not down at all, but you have these other companies that are down, but they've done such a great job at generating free cash flow and they're putting it into shareholder value creation and they're also putting it into their businesses so that they can grow. These are times when you do want to be buying. Do you want to buy in front of earnings? I don't know. Maybe you buy a little now, you buy a little bit on the earnings. 
But I do think that the U.S. companies have been amazingly resilient, especially on the margin front. And with commodity costs coming down, supply chains getting better, I just think they'll be able to weather the storm a little bit better. Again, they're already reflecting a ton of bad news. Steph, you wear a much different hat than we do. So as traders, regardless of thesis, regardless of whether or not the story changed, if something moves, whatever percentage against you, it's in our nature to cut your losses and take a fresh look because that's what traders do. But in your seat, it's a lot different. So in our world, price dictates action. But in your world, price doesn't really have anything to do with it. But sometimes the story does change and you have to change with it. Can you sort of speak to that? Because I think it's a really important distinction for people. Absolutely. So I do focus on fundamentals. I do think about, okay, total addressable market. What is a company's market share? As I mentioned before, really good free cash flow and balance sheets and all of that. If something changes, completely changes, then it is certainly worth taking a look. So for example, I owned for a while Win Resorts and I owned it because I thought, well, A, casinos, gaming, white hot in North America and in China and Macau, we know it's horrible. And we know that China is eventually going to reopen. Well, I actually recently trimmed that position because guess what? It seems like China is gonna be closed for an extended period of time. and that's a thesis changer. Even though it's only 25% of EBITDA for the company, it used to be 75%. It's a thesis changer for me because it's just going to take a lot longer for the story to work its way through. Not that it's a bad company, but it's opportunity cost. I could use that money elsewhere. And so I actually used that money and I bought Dollar General most recently. I just think no matter what environment we're going to see in the next year or so, they are able to deliver because they have an assortment mixed story. They have margin story. 80% of their business is consumable. So I am long-term, but if it's going to take more than I thought to make the story work and something happens in my process and my thesis changes, I have to take the loss and I just have to move on and kind of forget about it and just look for the next best idea. Steph, are there areas of the market right now, let's just say you think we're closer to the end than we are to the beginning of, let's say, this bear market. A lot of the recent price action in equities has been dictated by the rise in interest rates. We spend a lot of time talking about that right now. August 2nd, the 10-year U.S. Treasury yield was at 2.51 this morning. It traded 4 0.01 and it reversed. And guy, I'm just going to let you in here. It's trading at 3.7. Do you think that's at all natural there, buddy? But that was the fuel for equities today. Here we are. We're talking. It's Wednesday into the close and we're up 2%. And I just do not think if the 10 year was marching above four and looks like it was just on a runaway breakout and the US dollar index was continuing and it obviously reversed a little bit today too. I just don't think we'd have this upward price action in stocks right now. Talk to us about that that dynamic and then where in this environment, okay, none of us think that yields are going to come crashing down, but they're going to be elevated, especially year over year, other parts of the equity market where you really want to be exposed in that environment. So one of the areas where I think people have just written off are consumer discretionary. I think people think that the consumer is just going to roll right over. I think the three of us know that the US, we are a nation of spenders, no matter what. We take on debt if we have to, but we spend. Now, we could argue, is it goods? Is it services? It all pins on jobs. And I know that jobs eventually will come down because that's what the Fed wants. They want to see housing down and they want to see jobs down. They want to see jobs down because wages are too high and wages and rents are stickier parts of inflation. But I would say that this sector is just hated. It's totally ignored. And I think as long as we do have an unemployment, let's just say below four and a half percent, maybe it even at 5%. I think consumers will continue to spend because I don't think wages are going down. And at the same time, I think commodity prices, i.e. especially gasoline coming down is actually going to make them feel better. It may not happen right away, but I do think that 70% of our economy is the consumer and I'm not writing them off at this point in time. And the sector is down so much and so many stocks are just so hated. So that's an area where I like, I think interest rates. You mentioned that they're kind of all over the place. I personally think that we're still trying to figure out price discovery because we've got a Fed that's manipulating the market. So we have no idea what the real true price is and what the valuation is. But I do think that the financials can actually catch a bid here. I know they're hated too. 
they're very, very cheap and they do benefit. Many of them benefit from the short end going higher because they've got very sticky deposits. And you're talking about one times book with very good capital. The regulators have forced them to have excess capital. And so this is not 2008 all over again. I knock on wood, of course. I still think industrials are an attractive place to be. And I think that's onshoring, to be honest with you. I think that is what these stocks are kind of pricing in. And if the dollar just hangs back just a little bit, then that sector will do fine. Everybody wants to buy tech. Everybody wants to buy growth. I'm not 100% sure that works. Lastly, I would say I still think energy is attractive because I think structurally that industry has totally changed in terms of supply dynamics as well as shareholder value creation dynamics. Yeah, let's talk about energy real quick because I will tell you, I was one of those people that in the fall of last year, I thought energy was a place to be. That proved to be correct. I think when it spiked the commodity in March, I believe up to 130, we all thought it was a bit of a blow off top. The sell-off was probably a little more precipitous than I thought, but I did think we'd bounce. That bounce, I thought, would take us to new highs. It didn't happen. Now, Dan was all over it. He thought we'd actually mean revert to the levels that we find ourselves at now. I'm with you. I understand why people are selling the commodity. They feel that a global slowdown will see demand destruction, so they're trying to get ahead of that. It makes sense, coupled with the fact that the dollar has been on fire, and that creates some headwinds. With that said, you haven't seen the demand destruction that everybody is waiting for. So this is a bit of a rhetorical question, I guess. But what am I missing here in energy? Because these companies are run better than they've ever been run vis-a-vis ESG and vis-a-vis a time when the front month accrued went to minus $39 a barrel. All those things force them to run themselves better. They're just better companies. They're cheaper now. They should thrive in this environment, but the stocks aren't doing it. I think they've had a really nice run and I think people are afraid and people are taking at any cost, they're taking their gains where they can. I think it's very healthy to have a pullback. And I think that to your point, Guy, these companies are being run way better than they ever have. They're not cowboys anymore. They used to be. They are not overproducing when the crude prices go higher. So you don't have this boom bust kind of scenario. But what I think is really the reason why these stocks have come back is I don't think people believe in the supply story. And I think they are giving overemphasis to the demand destruction. But these companies have changed massively because of ESG and ESG investors, and they are getting more clean and more green, and they have all kinds of plans on doing so. And instead of overproducing, they're returning the free cash flow back to shareholders in buybacks, dividends, and special dividends. I've lost count how many times, for example, Diamondback, I think it's been four times they had a special dividend this year alone. It's incredible. The free cash flow stories are amazing. The break-evens are $40 to $50. So even oil here at these prices, they're still minting money. And perhaps maybe they don't return their free cash flow to shareholders as aggressively going forward. They're still going to do so. And I think that when you have companies being more efficient, you have the SPR, which we've got to now at 40-year lows, we have to go and replenish that. You have OPEC plus cutting production, I feel like the supply side of the story still is very, very lean. And I also think this one last thing, we haven't had to pay attention to energy for 10 years. It got to 3% of the S&P 500. It is now, after the rally this year, a whopping 5% of the S&P 500. So back in the 80s, as you both know, it was 19%. You had to pay attention to it. So I think people are non-believers. I don't think you have all the generalists understanding the energy market, not to the extent they should. And let's get worried when the growth managers start asking us about which energy stock to buy. Yeah, I'm with you. And this is more statement that you can respond to if you choose, but you don't have to take my word for it. I mean, people should listen to you long before they listen to me, but they should listen to Warren Buffett as well. I mean, you think about it, It's amazing when he's buying things that they love, like Apple or something, everybody champions him. He's a genius. He buys 19% of Oxy, and it's like the guy's lost something off his fastball. (laughs) Maybe he has, but, you know, he clearly sees something as well. 
in a sector now that everybody seemingly is sort of brushed to the side. Yeah, and I would just add, I think Warren Buffett is a value investor, and these are values. Believe it or not, these stocks, the PEs, the multiples, have actually come down while the estimates continue to go higher and the stocks go higher. So I think there's real value there. I think you just have to have confidence in the supply demand story. And, and yeah, if we got a deep recession, would these stocks pull back further? Of course they will. But find some quality ones. Find some ones that have good dividend yields. I was buying Chevron when it yielded 9% back in 2020. I mean, as long as you feel confident in the balance sheets, right? And that's why I mentioned free cash flow. Steph, let's go back to tech for a second, because when you're talking about the areas that you want to be exposed to in a recessionary environment or ones that might lead us out of this environment, you mentioned tech here. It's not a place that you kind of want to be as it relates to growth. And we know that some of the areas of the market that have been getting killed long before the S&P 500 topped out on January 2nd was high growth, high valuation tech. Now, we also know that the top five names in both the S&P and the NASDAQ are all tech names. So consumer discretionary, as you mentioned here. So we have Apple, Microsoft, they're trading about 25 times, Amazon, obviously the same. Google, Alphabet, much cheaper. I'm sure as a value gal, you're probably starting to kick the tires in a meta. These are trading at unusual values relative to the last 10 years. But is there a chance that the market can rally without those names? Because to me, obviously, they make up a huge part of the weight of those indices, but they also make up a lot of expected earnings growth. And really, just from a sentiment standpoint, expect them to be leaders. And I don't really see anybody who's ready to knock them off their incumbency right now. So I'm just curious as you think about maybe the concentration of those names and their ability to once again, get back on the horse and lead. And then also, what about all these names that have been absolutely murdered down six 70, 80%. Well, those are the ones that probably don't have earnings. So that's the one place I don't want to be buying, especially as interest rates inch higher. And I think interest rates are going to inch higher. And if they don't inch higher from here and I'm wrong, I still believe they'll stay high. And so the non-earners, no touch for me, unless you want to take a flyer, one or two, that's perfectly fine. Take the one you like and have at it. But that is not where I want to be focused as a long-term investor. Not when I can get some of these fang names that are down 20, 30, 40, all in the meta 50, 60%. Um, so I don't know if they're going to be leaders, but I do think that the market will struggle if the tech and comm services as a whole, if you add them together, if they underperform, because it's 35% of the S&P 500. So therefore you need every other sector to outperform for the market to do better. And so I think that's a tall ask. That being said, I do think that there is a way to play tech. And I think that's like kind of a barbell. Like I have some value names and I, with some dividends and I have some growth names with great total addressable markets, which are expensive, but I feel very strongly that their earnings over the long period of time will remain above average. Again, because they are in the total addressable market space of cybersecurity, AI, cloud, data center. We know all the themes. And so I definitely want to have exposure there. But I don't necessarily think you have to have this broad stroke of just growth and just tech, especially as rates remain elevated. But it remains to be seen. I will say this, I just talked to a colleague of mine and I thought, well, I own Meta, unfortunately, I've suffered with it. But actually, Alphabet is starting to become much more interesting to me, down 30%, trading at 17 times forward. Not there just yet, but we get another down leg in the market. I think that's quality on sale. And that's sort of kind of how I invest. John Malkovich. Matt Damon, Ed Norton, great movie, Rounders, love it. If it's on, I'm watching it. Why you say, guy, what the, why are you, because everybody has a tell and you just showed your tell. When you said have at it, that proved to me that you actually watch Fast Money because that's Dan Nathan's <laughs> favorite. Have at it, people. You channeled your inner Dan Nathan Fast Money. I did. Don't pretend you don't watch number one. Anyway, listen, before we get out of here, the independent advisory world, that's where everybody's going. I mean, it's clear the wirehousers, they seem to be dinosaurs, the LPLs of the world. But Hightower, you got a lot of really cool things going on under the stewardship of uh, Bob Oros, who happens to be a friend, full disclosure. Just speak to that real quick. I will. I'm, I'm a big fan of both of you. And I actually DVR all the time. Fast money. All Stop the it time. now. Okay. I Don't do. bullshit me, Steph. Now I'm I know not. you just you were doing so well. I promise. And at the 30 minute mark, you, you spit the bit. My daughter wants to watch it with me. That's even the better of it all, right? So she's learning. So no, seriously, it's a great, great show. I always enjoy it. I always feel like I'm in the know. 
the immediate no. I feel like I know my stuff, but you guys, you know the minute to minute stuff and why things are actually acting the way they are, which is really pretty darn cool and very, very hard. So thanks for the plug for Hightower as well as Bob Oros. We're doing a really great job in terms of growing both organically and inorganically, meaning M&A. And what I really enjoy about the firm is that it does have the size and the scale in the industry and the market share, but it also has that intimate feel of just good people wanting to grow. And you guys have been in this business just as long as I, if not longer. And you know the financial services industry is under enormous stress in terms of buy side and sell side. And well, the independent wealth management channel is actually growing and that's sort of been a fun part to be a part of. So thanks for the shout out there. Well, Steph, they're lucky to have you as a voice and a a face of the organization and just right back at you too. I mean, we really enjoy listening and watching you on the investment committee. I saw you on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange with Scott last week and the OT there. And it's always fun to listen to your commentary. So Guy and I, we can't be happier about having you join us on the tape and we hope that you will come back soon, Steph. Always. Thank you so much, guys. Thanks once again to CME Group and iConnections for sponsoring this episode of On The Tape. If you like what you heard, make sure you hit follow and leave us a review. It helps people find our show and we love hearing from you. You can also email us at onthetape at riskreversal.com anytime. Follow and connect with us on Twitter at On The Tape Pod, and we'll see you next time. On The Tape is a Risk Reversal media production. This podcast is for informational purposes only. All opinions expressed by me, Dan Nathan, Guy Adami, Danny Moses, and any other participants are solely our opinions and should not be relied upon for specific investment decisions. (laughs) 